Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This is a podcast that explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research. And today's interview is with Antoine Saka and Lior Roseman, who are two of the authors behind the paper titled Relational Processes in Ayahuasca Groups of Palestinians and Israelis, which means we're going to talk about the research they found in conflict resolution emerging out of shared experiences of ayahuasca in joint spaces having both Israelis and Palestinians, in particular ayahuasca ceremonies that were happening in the West Bank. So let's start off with uh, their bios. Leah Roseman is a postdoc at the Center for Psychedelic Research, Imperial College London, where he received his PhD and Master's of Research under the supervision of Dr. Robin Carhart Harris and Professor David Nutt. His research interests are diverse and cover neuroscientific, phenomenological, therapeutic, and psychosocial aspects of psychedelic use. Currently, Lior is investigating relational processes and group dynamics in psychedelic rituals. His main line of research is examining the potential of psychedelics for peace building. While his research is currently focused on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, he and his collaborators are hoping to develop an approach that is applicable in other contexts as well. So that's Lior. Antoine Saka was born in Jerusalem to a Christian family from the city of Bethlehem. He spent his adult life working towards the dream of peace and justice in the Holy Land. He spent five years at the Holy Land Trust serving as a director of programs where he experienced community healing approaches that strengthened his interest in nonviolent compassion activism. Since then, he's focused on community dynamics and the many forms of personal slash collective experienced and inherited trauma that influence conflict resolution in the Holy Land. He believes that healing the pain of the past is a prerequisite for healthy relations between nations and ultimately peace. He previously worked as program coordinator at the Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation and as a research assistant for urbanization and geopolitical monitoring at the Applied Research Institute in Jerusalem. He was also a youth leader and a member of the One Voice Movement and he has graduated from the Arab American University of Jenin with a bachelor's in public law. So these are the two people that we have on the show to discuss their research around Israelis and Palestinians drinking ayahuasca together and experiencing things that lead to a sense of conflict resolution, which is going to mean that we're getting into a pretty complex topic today. We're getting into the complexity of you know human conflict but in particular, the complexity of human conflict unfolding at like the very basis of our cultural identities over many decades at this point that is presently existing in the reality of a militarized conflict zone where people are dying as a consequence and even recently. So this is a heavy and complex topic. And in fact, even getting into the interview for the first few minutes, it feels kind of like it feels complex. It felt like in the beginning, I didn't know where my legs were before my legs sort of came as a consequence of engaging the content. So in order to maybe give you a little bit of legs before we uh, drop into the interview, I'm also going to read a section of the abstract of this paper. Um, I know this is a little heavy on the intro, but I think it all serves the purpose of um, properly contextualizing this conversation in a way that uh, will make it more accessible. So pardon me a second here. And here we go. Okay, so <clears throat> the paper again is called Relational Processes in Ayahuasca Groups of Palestinians and Israelis. Psychedelics are used in many group contexts. However, most phenomenological research on psychedelics is focused on personal experiences. This paper presents a phenomenological investigation centered on intersubjective and intercultural relational processes, exploring how an intercultural context affects both the group and individual process. Through 31 in-depth interviews, ceremonies in which Palestinians and Israelis drink ayahuasca together have been investigated. The overarching question guiding this inquiry was how psychedelics might contribute to the processes of peace building, and in particular, how an intercultural context embedded in a protracted conflict would affect the group's psychedelic process in a relational sense. So that's an abs that's part of the abstract of the research 
paper that I am interviewing Antoine and Lior about. So that's sort of some some legs <laughs> before we jump in. Um, and with that said, before we jump in, I'd like to thank my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode. Those people have been giving significantly, some of which for a long time. And thank you in general to all my patrons, because you are what allows me to continue investing full time in the production, uh, the, the research and production of the show, um, and to make it so that the content is unhindered by efforts towards sponsorship or commercialization and free for everyone to listen to. So thank you so much, patrons. If you're not yet a patron of the show and you'd like to become one, please do by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso. Other ways you can financially support the show include PayPal or cryptocurrency, and links to that are contained in the description to this episode. So please do contribute financially to the show. I much, very much appreciate it, and thank you. If you tune into the end, I have something special. It's sort of a, you know, sort of an insight into my life and also a, a bit of a request. So if you are open to that, stay tuned to after this interview to hear that. Um, and with all that being said, here is my interview with Antoine Saka and Leo Roseman on Adventures to the Mind, episode 144, exploring relational processes in ayahuasca groups of Palestinians and Israelis. Enjoy. This is a complex subject, uh, not only because psychedelic experiences are complex, psychedelic experiences in group settings are complex, psychedelic experiences in group settings with groups who are historically uh, sort of a antagonistic with each other, but also because the groups in the psychedelic experiences that we're going to talk about today are um, Palestinian people and Israeli people drinking ayahuasca together, which of course is very complex from a historical perspective, from a political perspective, um, and from an identity perspective on how people identify with themselves, which you talked about in your paper. But also because we are just on, we're just in the, the tail of a very violent sort of event that happened between Israel and Palestine, which only happened about a month ago. I'm not up to date with what's happening now. From what I understand, the active um, firing upon each other is not now. Um, but nonetheless, it's complex. It's very sensitive material. And uh, Leo, you're from Israel, and Antoine, you're from Palestine. And so it would seem clear that there are some personal motivations behind the study. And so I think maybe to start us off, because it's so complex, it would make sense to, to get a clear sense of where each of you are coming from on this study, um, and why collectively you decided it was a good idea to run it. And interwoven in that is sort of a presentation of what this study is all about. And uh, I'll let you guys decide between each other who speaks when. Okay, I'll speak. Uh, yeah, so uh, I was doing psychedelic research for like a few years already in Imperial College and doing mainly neuroscience and therapy uh, research. Uh, but from my personal processes, I always felt that like the, the social element, the group element, uh, was very impactful on my own journeys. So, and also being in London and being kind of far from my home, but seeing all the suffering that happens at home, uh, both of these were kind of incentives for me to start working and studying, doing research on groups and kind of going into finding, as I wanted to speak about also relational issues and social issues, obviously finding the conflict at my home uh, as the most relevant for that. Uh, so there was an incentive also like bring healing to home to some extent and an incentive of just discussing uh, relational and social elements through that, uh, which is more aligned with my own uh, personal journey. Uh, so it's kind of started to, to team up with people and find people. And Antoine was like the many paths, many directions have like showed me many very different people told me you need to speak with Antoine, you know, you need to partner. Uh, with Antoine. Uh, so this is kind of was the initial uh, process. Yeah. Uh, my side, I don't come from the background of 
studying psychedelics. I come from the background of uh, being socially active uh, on the ground with communities here and mainly specifically in what has been known for the last 25 years plus of joint spaces of Palestinians and Israelis activists coming to dialogue or to take action together into transforming the realities that we live in. So this is the background that I come from and this is also where the interest grew in this work with Lior because uh, my personal encounter in the process of healing with psychedelics and the power of healing, it became very clear that this has also an element to look at on the relational level between, in, in this space where it happens that there are Palestinians and Israelis who do psychedelics together. And uh, noticing the dynamics that exist in those spaces was not something uh, of uh, new to me, because uh, I'm again witnessing those dynamics in joint spaces where the Israelis and Palestinians have came intentionally in the past, whether trying to change a reality outside that they live in, or whether to have a conversation of coming to know the other on a human level. So very a lot of similarities that happened there, but definitely the depth of what psychedelic could lead into deepening the conversation into even shattering our understandings of possibilities and seeing how that gets, uh, let's say, expanded for us as individuals in those spaces. Uh, I'll tell you honestly, it was a pool of uh, possibilities coming down at the time of burnout that I was experiencing from, again, 20 plus years of a failure attempt of civil peacemaking in a certain approach. Hmm. Uh, Lior, did you want to comment on that further? No, that's good. Okay. Um, so your study was to observe groups of people, which were a mix of is Israeli people and Palestinian people. And I think there was, there were some groups that in included Christians as well. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the case. Um, could I get a yes or a no from you guys? Yes. The Palestinians were Christian and Muslim Palestinians. Okay, great. Um, so yes, uh, so and drinking, drink, coming together, and drinking ayahuasca together, and having experiences in these in these ayahuasca ceremonies that led to um, some sense of of cultural or a co conflict resolve, some sort of deep resolution somewhere in where that conflict is held inside of themselves, and I mean, perhaps I'm opening a giant can of worms here. Um, but maybe, <laughs> I don't know why somebody listening wouldn't have a sense of this, but maybe you can give us a sense before we go into the actual things that you discovered and in, uh, in your study, what the actual context of these ayahuasca circles are. Like, what is the context in between Israel and Palestine? What are the dynamics there that make the idea of Israelis and Palestinians coming together to drink ayahuasca and have you know, conflict resolving experiences, such a profound even concept, let alone a discovery of it being an actual thing that's happening. Yeah, so the groups, uh, the groups are like, like, it's important to know that the groups, they're mainly of Israelis, the groups that we observed, they're mainly uh, Israelis, there's a majority of Israelis there, which is also the majority of those who hold the kind of power in the ceremony. So the musicians and facilitators and and the language of the ceremony, uh, many, much of the song is many times is in Hebrew or Jewish related. So in, in this context, Palestinians started joining kind of is, Israelis, most of the groups, some of the groups were different, but started joining groups of Israelis because they kind of that was the access of Palestinians to to these to these groups so it wasn't necessarily with the intention of uh, conflict resolution or reconciliation it just happened to be and it definitely was part of their process but it wasn't the initial intention of those groups uh, so the Palestinians are a minority and the, when I speak about Palestinians I speak about Palestinians from uh, West Bank and Palestinians who live in Israel and the people we interviewed are Palestinians from, from both of these sides uh, in the ceremonies. Uh, so that was kind of what I think brought people together. It's just the regular psycho spiritual uh, adventures, healing, uh, journeying with ayahuasca. Yeah. Antoine, do you have maybe something to add on the groups? I think, I just, well, I think what, what makes it in a way is 
special as we just enter to talk about it more and more is just as you mentioned people were coming to resolve in a way some personal conflicts maybe not necessarily again with an interest of or an intention of looking at the greater surrounding that we are experiencing and this is a dynamic that we would witness also in conflict resolution in general that there is always this relation of what lives in, in the individual and how it mirrors to the community to the surrounding that they live in so it's very important to understand that those even experiences that they went with no intentions of facing the elephant in the room let's call it and not call it a conflict let's call it the elephant in the room because it's beyond the conflict it's it's pain intergenerationally both sides it's trauma it's post traumatic also in a sense so it's beyond just trying to also say it's just only a conflict and to really understand that they weren't with that intention yet coming to this joint space makes people uh, anyway f- uh, face this reality hmm. so i i i want to i want to i want to sort of deepen into this too because these these ceremonies are happening in a in a in a large they're nested within a larger socio political context um that expands throughout time in history and with the intention of the individuals in the group to go in for some personal healing you know and and finding sort of larger cultural healing spaces coming in um seems now like it seems like it makes sense and also this cultural healing is something that is a a reconciliation is something that is emerging out of of a a very severe long-standing very violent um, conflict that has been happening between Israeli people and Palestinian people. And one of the things that you present is a hypothesis around identity, uh, conflict-based identities. And so, I, I again, I, 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 I strive to understand because there's layers of complexity here that are so far outside of my understanding though so i'm probing into the unknown unknowns with you guys but but what i'm seeing here is 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 this wondering about the intensity of the of this conflict that exists in the people now individually collectively social socially politically and eastern like embedded into cultural identities and all of that being in each of these individuals all of those power dynamics and all of the pain and whatever in each of these individuals approaching these ceremonies. And I think I want to get a better understanding of how how large of a thing it is, even for, for people living in the West Bank, living in that part of the world to come together at all, let alone come together to t- drink ayahuasca. And so there's a very open-ended question to get to get both of you guys sort of perspectives on that. I mean, just starting with the West Bank and understanding really the, the 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 realities on the ground. We're talking about population that is segmented geopolitically, also separated from a large community that lives in Gaza, also from a large community of Palestinians that resides within Israel. Uh, two million almost who <clears throat> reside within uh, Israel right now, and so that alone in itself, that uh, sense of segmentation, fragmentation is a layer that if you ask me as a Palestinian when coming to joint spaces is not an easy layer to just simply share off yourself and just jump into a space being just humanistically, uh, just being in the humanistic element immediately. And so this is why when we're talking about people who have done those spaces, we're not again talking about people who necessarily had that in mind or prepared for that. And therefore, we're talking about experiences that, in how you describe it in a way, uh, are not easy. There's experiences that are shattering, experiences that are expanding also at the same time. Uh, we're talking, again, I would say this goes for both sides. We're talking about spaces where this elephant in the room that shatters what we collectively hold as master narratives of who we are, our identities what forms me as, as a Palestinian and what forms the other as an, an Israeli, part of that, in a sense, in, uh, and, and in a way trying to describe what we live, part of that is existential threat. And in, in that existential threat, 
at the story of the other and the acknowledgement of the story of the other or the culture of the other or the pain of the other in that way is so threatening to the level that if you embrace that, you are losing your whole identity. So we're talking about spaces where people are getting that sometimes in a shocking, gentle way where they're able to face intentionally or not this elephant in the room. This is so core to the existence, I would say, of every individual who is living within this militarized conflict that we are stuck in as communities. So I would say that's the depth, if you want to ask, to what extent. To what extent. Dior, if you want to add on the identities matter? Yes, definitely. I mean, the identities are also like so much dependent on each other, you know, it's like the the other, the enemy is like the way one's built his own identity is also in relation to that other enemy, you know. So in peace research, identities are, are a core part of investigating peace research. There's a term called like the ethos of conflict, the narratives you build in order to kind of preserve the your reality. Uh, and what is kind of cool about these theories is that once this collapse, once the narrative is challenged, uh, you're actually, you might have a psychological burden with you. So those, the ethos, the narrative, the identity, they're also there, have a psychological function. They, they excuse the reality, uh, and the way the reality is, even if the reality is un- unjust. Uh, and they kind of, shattering that can actually have a psychological burden can actually create anxiety as well so it's kind of uh, the identities are there to also uh, protect in a way the the well-being of people so challenging them is also something quite complex uh and uh from the groups that we investigated i think most of the people that were there uh were already open to the idea of like meeting the other they were not very you know extreme uh some were, some told us that they were extreme and the reason they came to the groups was uh, personal healing uh, and then, you know, something opened up there for, uh, in, in the kind of political level. Uh, but most of the people in the groups were relatively open, but that doesn't mean that there's not like a lot of unconscious or conscious material that's related to the conflict and fears and stigma and and kind of uh, narratives that that are are still can be challenged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I, I think I, I feel like it was woven into each of what you just said there. Um, but also, there's something it feels like unexplicitly touched, which is that in the discussion of of conflict based identities and everything that comes with that, when stepping into a dynamic with one's other, um especially in a dynamic where where what's happening in the in the sort of coming with one's other is a complete disintegration of your psychological emotional physical even boundaries uh, or at least potentially you know your ability to protect your own boundaries is gone <laughs> you know uh, with ayahuasca on, on every level right that's kind of the point i guess right um and so with this discussion about narrative and identity Okay, yeah, so you know, Palestinians and Israelis, a lot of them come up to learn to hate each other, to learn that the other is the existential threat, regardless of what side you are. You know, the dynamics look different from either either side, obviously. They would have to be in order to sustain the other always being the bad one, right? But when we discuss narrative and identity, it's really easy to then sort of come to this place of like, oh yeah, so everything's actually okay, it's all just a narrative issue, and on some level, possibly, it could all be okay, and it's just a narrative level, but on the ground, and and I accept that and am willing to be confronted with the, uh, with the, um, the claim that my narrative now is flattened, uncomplex, misunderstanding, but from my position completely outside of the West Bank and of any identification with either of those cultures, it appears to me that although narrative is involved, there's actually a very real, very serious power dynamic that disproportionately victimizes the Palestinians. Um, and so I would, I'm, I'm interested to hear what your, what your comments are around witnessing that as, as, as a reality for, for these people to be stepping in and then in stepping into power dynamics that even within the group are, you know, disproportionately, um, 
like Palestinians are disproportionately underrepresented. Um, so again, open, pretty open, but I'd love to hear your comments there. So <clears throat> the reality on the ground is very simple in how you described it. There is a power imbalance. It's not a matter again of just a narrative for sure. If it was a matter of narrative, I feel we would have solved it long time ago. Mm -hmm. Yet master narratives are part of those identities that clash and identities are clashing on the ground. It's not to deny that, it's to realize the strength actually that exists in that. And when we're saying identity clashes in this pretext in a way, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the person who likes those kinds of dialogues that move us into action, let's say. So when I'm seeing and, and being able to see a space where an Israeli and a Palestinian are being able to experience this, uh, hi this hybridness of this narrative and this narrative, being able to survive, seeing through, seeing th that through, and uh, I'll tell you honestly, th seeing that through the multiple uh, uh, possibilities that you even experience with psychedelics sometimes, and not with psychedelics, with experiences of encounter and depth. And that tells us that there is something there valuable to tap into. Does it mean that uh, ayahuasca is going to solve the conflict, it's going to solve the power imbalance, no, it's going to solve the injustices, no, it's just again to look deep there and see what are we, what could we be learning from those people and their processes to bring out to the larger community and, and to really understand and to uh, really come with humbleness to Understand that this is a process witnessed in a cognitive level that takes us sometimes months, sometimes years. And seeing this level of depth happening in hours, it's not something to say it's magic, but it's again, it's to really look at and, and learn. Now, how do we see that those realities influence those spaces? It's definitely there. I can tell you of many Palestinians who've gone to those spaces where this power imbalance even if it's not in a structure of where people sit and how people are treated, it's felt through language. It's felt through uh, what Israelis are celebrating of uh, uh, cultural, uh, cultural uh, songs and other things in this practice. So there are spaces that are becoming conscious, who are asking those questions and bringing those uh, sensations, let's say, and those those uh, new understandings to what this space means and saying, okay, there's, there are spaces for Palestinians alone, where Palestinians need to be getting their own experiences first, build their own muscle first, to find themselves, to be able to come authentically to Israelis to those spaces. Because in that space, a Palestinian needs to look at an Israeli and tell him in the eye or tell her in the eye, I have pain. They need to be able to do that. And, and that is where we need to look at that space and see if it is missing and how we can support it. And that is also where we can look at the space and see actually how it can help in uh, responding to things that are part of reality. It does not den de deny the reality outside. It does not change it, the space, but definitely it's a place to actually bring the reality in and to allow us to look deeper into what maintains this power dynamic that maintains this reality that we're not comfortable with. We're not able to see it after many years of pain, 70 years plus of mutual pain, almost 30 years of a mistrust process of trying to do peace that is not working so far. So we're in so much pain, I would say, that we've came to a place what what psychologists call as inhibition in a way, where we're unable to go beyond. And this is where we're saying, let's let's look humbly and learn what's happening there and try to respond again to what we're failing to respond to outside. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, James, what your question is like the core tension of what we do, you know? This is something Antoine and I observed like very quick, like after... You know, two, two interviews, we started asking questions of actually what we are investigating, what, what is the potential, and we started to developing the critique as well 
of the groups that we observed. So, you know, one of the themes that we, like the three themes that we published in the paper, there, I mean, there are more stuff to come, but the three themes that we published in the paper, the first of them is this kind of identity dissolution and this kind of uh, peeling of identity beyond Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Christian, and so on, and connecting uh, as human to human, you know? And that was very important and deep moment for people and very connecting, very strongly creating also like tribal connections. But there's also a critique of that, you know, focusing too much on this, which is like this kind of uh, neglecting the political reality of asymmetry, of occupation of Palestinians, of real injustice, uh, you know? So definitely the groups that we observe were not perfect. We were kind of learning to, from them also what how we want to improve that in the future. Uh, and some of the narratives were not necessarily challenged in that space. Uh, so, you know, me and Antoine, after like few, three interviews, I think we were like at midnight after a whole day of road trip. And we were just like sitting in the car and both of us didn't, we didn't verbalize it to each other, this tension, but we were just like both of us holding our head and kind of like, kind of shit, what are we doing? You know, like, are, are we actually tapping into something or are we normalizing the situation? And and it felt like most of our interviewers were actually talking about like this uh, being a political uh, and what we observe this identity dissolution. If it's too fetishized, you know, as the kind of the main thing, it can create this like a political motivation, in which peace is just an inner process, and uh, there's no need to actually act on uh, reality outside. So that's kind of like the the tension. It's a known tension between kind of new age spirituality and activism. <laughs> it's a tension between like uh, anger uh, and resistance uh, with acceptance. Uh, so you know the ethos of acceptance, which is part of the psychedelic kind of uh, therapy ethos, might sometimes kind of deny the need to actually resist injustice, be angry at injustice uh, when it's needed. Uh, so anger is a very valid emotion and sometimes it's cancelled or it's illegal in these spaces. Uh, so though, and, but then we kind of continue to investigate it and what we saw is that there's more than that. There's more than an identity dissolution and challenging narratives or identities is not just like the peeling of them or cancelling them, but it's like how to, how to shift them. Uh, so, for example, the, the third team and the second team were much more based on uh, the the relations. So, you know, uh, for Israeli to listen to a Palestinian woman singing is very much opening, very much like a, people talk about expansion and open and opening. And the, the elephant in the room is in a way there it suddenly kind of penetrates the, the, the space. And the third team, which was uh, even more political, was uh, uh, actually political revelations of conflict, you know, like like the Nakba, uh, seeing uh, dead Palestinian coming out of the grave and kind of being uh, displaced and, go, and taking take, being taken on buses to Lebanon or uh, seeing the bleeding of the land and the kind of the, the blood that's kind of going into the land from these cycles of conflict and mothers who sacrifice their own children. And this is like very, very loaded. And a lot of times they also resulted in anger. They brought anger to the space uh, that was expressed by the individual uh, to the group, the individual who had these revelations. And he was trying to change. He was trying to intervene in the kind of harmony of the, the ceremony in some way. And kind of how we kind of perceive it as well is that I think the sh shattering moments of uh, narratives are not just, they're not just sh change of narratives, they can activate. So if you can imagine like uh, insight, a strong insight, a strong revelation as a moment which all of your, like the way you perceive reality is changed. And when you have such insights, sometimes you develop this kind of loyalty to these moments and you start acting in order to show others or to kind of change the reality according to those new insights. So like, aha moments uh, can lead to a, a direction which is also a direction of resistance towards like oppressive structures. Uh, so uh, we kind of feel that this is also part of the energy, at least we saw that potential in some of the people we interviewed, and it's something that we kind of see how we developed in, in some ways in, in future projects, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'd love to create a space here, Antoine, if you'd like to build on that or comment further. 
It just, uh, just yeah, just from uh, the coming from the social uh, community side. It just when you encounter this space and you encounter those interviews, and you see the ups and downs, the bottom to the bottom point you're left with. Okay, how can I help? Actually, support because people are gonna go through those spaces, whether uh, comfort is resolved today or in I don't know how long. Uh, joint space is a is a reality that exists in almost every conflict uh, around the world. And uh, coming from the social activist realm, I feel that there is again a lot to be learned from there and a lot to be given by also to support those who decide to go in a joint space because uh, the transformation is deep, the, the the work there is deep, and if if nurtured, it can grow flowers for communities. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to comment on this on this concept of, of, of it nurturing communities. I think it's fair to say that um, that what happens within the ayahuasca ceremony is not necessarily reflective of what a person's life is like outside of that ceremony, right? That, uh, you know, I can go to an ayahuasca circle and I can have a certain dynamic of interactions and Okay, totally the, the whole conflict thing, the, the elephant in the room, concept, let's, let's just put that totally aside for a second. If I show up to an ayahuasca circle, I'm going to build an intimate relationship with those people because of having shared that experience with them. And it's fair to assume that for most people, they're going to come home and what they've learned and discovered with those people, as well as in general about themselves, about their lives, about the culture that they live in is not necessarily going to be shared with those around them. And that can result in, uh, it could result in those things being hidden, um, occulted from, from people's lives and being, from sh being shared with others, or it could just in generally just create quite a struggle in the integration process, right? So then bringing back in the elephant in the room, bringing back in the actual context in which these, cere these ayahuasca ceremonies are happening, you know, I think it's probably fair to assume that a lot of these people are coming home from the from those experiences and having this wide opening, this healing, this conflict resolution, this sort of like maybe accessing their anger and the resistance in a positive way, all of these great experiences, but then stepping back into a, a, a narrative space, a cultural identity space, a cultural space that is still antithetical to what they stepped into, while also still being the lived reality of the actual power imbalance, violence, you know, and, and they're going back into that space and attempting to integrate. Um, so I would love your comments on that. Oh, Antoine, you're muted, sorry. Again, uh, this is not something new because this is again what is the experience of civil society in joint space for the last 25 years in civil society to work for peace. Because again, people coming to meeting each other and just being sent back home without support, without integration processes, without communities that hold them as they go through this when they're home is what we've missed in the bigger image of peacemaking in this land for the last 25 years. If you ask me as an activist, this is the where we have been the weakest in for the last 25 years. So this is not different also from this space. That's why the people we've interviewed, some of them had that kind of support when they went back home. They had people from within their own community who were able to hold them within the within this process of integration after and have space to reflect of what is that awe of that moment with the other in that joint space means in day-to-day -day life. So yes, some were lucky to have that, but not everyone. And that's what we noticed. And that's why I'm saying it's a responsibility after witnessing all of that to just say it's a responsibility for me as a Palestinian to say we need to have a talk as Palestinians because if we're going to need, if we're going to go continue going to those spaces, then we, then we need to make sure that there are people who are going to support those people, at least as a person who's active in this, this joint element space that is not necessarily, again, only related to medicine. Uh, 
Our wish is that this becomes a normalized medicine practice globally where communities can do that without shame. In our community right now, it's something under the ground. So I I personally know that many are putting a tremendous effort into building this continually uh, underground community that can hold people. But is it something that we have on a large scale right now? No, it's not. And uh, again, th this again comes down to integration, integration, integration of people after psychedelics, whether it's joint or not joint, even with people of your own people, you always need integration of what this means in your life. Yeah, and I guess, you know, one, one thing to add on the, on the groups that we researched that many of them are, it's not a retreat, so they are uh, uh, drinking each other on a constant basis. There are co active communities, and as they drink more, they become more of a strong, you know, tribe or family or community. Uh, some on a yearly, once a year, some more than that. Uh, but there is definitely this kind of intention of creating a dynamic community that's changing, that's becoming closer together, that's supporting each other, developing responsibility for each other. Uh, but then again, you know, the reality outside is challenging. One of the Palestinian interviewees like, said, you know, I cannot go to, back home to a checkpoint and say, I'm a spiritual light being, let me go through, you know, right, or, yeah. or, or I cannot heal trauma because trauma is ongoing. It's not like post-traumatic. It's like a continuous complex living in trauma, you know, so what you can do is maybe heal some of it, but you know, it can, it can give you energy for a while, but it will repeat because it's still still happening. Uh, and I guess these are the tensions, you know. So many of the the groups we investigated because of that tension, they also can become uh, closer uh, and, and and quite sometimes even closed. You know, there's this potential because the outside world doesn't necessarily be, uh, understands them, but they very much understand each other. You know, so strong strong friendships friendships are creating created did not necessarily transferred uh, to the outside world and a almost everybody that we interviewed has this kind of plan b in life uh, to move to portugal or move to costa rica you know it's kind of like they they enjoy so much like the the unity the one is the apolitical tension uh, peeled from identities and then like the tension of actually living a reality with these identities with these like such separation can be actually challenging and uh, so there is also sometimes people just want to like, you know, drop out and and leave the kind of political reality because of that. Um, yeah, but it's a it's a complex one. It's a complex question. And, and in the end, it's uh, as the practice is more legitimized, uh, it's easier to create communities uh, outside outside of the practice that support each other and that people can return home and they can find the like minded people or even better, the community uh, becomes uh, a, a stronger community and not just something you retreat to, to uh, from your daily life. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about uh, sort of from from a point of like how I can relate to someone not in this in the living in this in this kind of reality that that type of contrast of stepping out of those experiences into a, into a different cultural space would be something akin to um, learning the value of and the in the and, and the beauty and the importance of being able to be fully in grief and to let yourself be moved by grief and cry and hurt, you know, and weep and love. And then going into a place where at a moment when that grief is most alive and you know deeply, fully, it's right and good to feel this and to be crushed by it, to be around a bunch of people who in their mind, the most important thing to help you is to make sure they can make the symptoms of those grief that grief go away where talking about things that are deeply moved by grief or sadness or death you know are now sort of uh, they're taboo they're not allowed they're judged or you might be ill if you're feeling too much grief for too long um, and how profoundly isolating that can feel and I wonder now this is just me wondering aloud about the dynamic between you know being in a uh, sort of plugging back into the matrix you know like cypher wanted to get plugged back into the matrix which is like you know the there was the distress of living in the narrative and now there's the 
uh, the narrative formed around the very real conflict, the very real violence, and now there's the distress of still living in the very real violence, the very real conflict, but now you're isolated and separated from the communitas that that identifying with that cultural narrative, be it informed of hate and violence, you know, that, that communitas is now lost. And so the, the lived reality of it is all there, but now there's also the pain of isolation. Um, is that something that, uh, that any of your participants spoke to or you would like to speak to? I mean, from a theoretical perspective, communitas is like, you know, when you look at, at the theory itself, this is also part of the challenge in the theory, and this is part of the tension, whether the communitas of a small space, of the liminal space, of the transitional small group space, can actually uh, change reality or preserve reality as is because it's just a cathartic moment uh, from the tensions of reality, but then you return to alienation, conflict, and so on. Uh, I think the, the 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 people who we interviewed, I think that is the main reason why they it was hard for them to return to political reality. They 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 were v very much apolitical uh, because if that that was the tension that was like they felt. The kind of sweet communitas, and then uh, they stop, you know, engaging with news or any any discussion on conflict uh, because because of that tension. I think, you know, uh, and the moving to Portugal is kind of uh, or the wanting to move to Portugal is part of that as well. Uh, so people people express that, uh, yeah, and people even if they don't express that, you see based on their actions. That, that tension exists. Uh, so, you know, one way is to uh, not engaging with the conflict. The other way is trying to solve it, try to uh, bring that communitas, that feeling uh, into larger reality and start engaging in the conflict in a way that's uh, trying to, to change it. Uh, but that's challenging because not everybody, you know, if we're talking about activism, not many activism understand uh, how to operate from that intention. So even if somebody wants to do that, he doesn't necessarily find the like-minded people that can start act with him uh, in a similar way with that kind of energy behind the action. But, you know, I think slowly, slowly things are changing. So like-minded people slowly, slowly find each other and find, you know, and as well, what, what we are doing is part of that, trying to find this new way of engaging in kind of political reality and activism through uh, the insights that come from that kind of psychedelic space. Yeah. yeah Antoine, you, you can take it. I mean, um, not much to add because this is the reality. I just want to, I recall in some of the interview, speak, uh, some Palestinians uh, shared that for them it was way of saying seeing differently how to direct this energy that we are describing in a sense there is this reality of oppression there is this reality of tension there is this reality of uh, feeling threatened and the reality of whatever they have inherited and some participants in a way and what i remember <clears throat> the testimony is expressed um, getting some part of this restorative justice process triggered, response, responded to some level of it, uh, getting certain recognitions in that spaces, uh, allowing them in a way to try to find, and this is again personal for them, it doesn't mean that this is transforming the conflict in general, but this is an interesting, again, interesting thing to look at for us as we are stuck in this conflict how people decided to respond differently than just anger that they used to keep in and therefore just keep it for themselves and uh, harm themselves. Some expressed that they found a way out of uh, where to bring this anger to, how to bring it, whether communicating it the healthy way or whether bringing it into, into action. <clears throat> Some described in my memory of seeking even... Uh, success in businesses just to to make sure that they 
they are there and that they're going to continue and that their presence in this land is going to be important just like everyone and they found in a way their way of resistance because that's for them their gift they're good in making money in their life and for them to channel this into actually making it as a statement i exist and i'm important figure and taking active role in finance in community is a way that came out for them based on those experiences so it's not necessarily that it denies or that it responds to directly to what happening day to day but in the in the being of individuals who are going to join space who again we owe them a lot because we are learning from them deeply and we really be, need to be responsible with what we learn to bring out and support them because they're going deeper and there's a lot of things that we can learn from that to bring outside to a community that is not moving forward for the last 30 years. Yeah, maybe I'll add also like uh, the, I guess that that tension maybe of coming back to reality is also a motivation of, yeah, again, of trying to, to change it. And, you, you know, as I said, my, maybe people don't yet uh, find a coalition of like-minded people to create change together. Uh, but, you know, people are trying in their own way based on their own history, based on their own talents and skills, uh, whether it's like musicians and artists, which are part of the group, and then they transfer it into their art and music, which is changed through these processes, or people in the education system. So uh, a teacher in a mixed school uh, kind of told us that that from kind of uh, this imaginative process with ayahuasca of like seeing the other becoming the other she started doing stuff like this within her school which is a mixed school so she's palestinian and she works in a mixed school and she started to to do this practice of uh, be, imagining the other closing your eyes and trying to become the other uh, so you know people trying to transfer their insights based on their own where they are they are in life and what they can do uh, yeah mm -hmm. I have a question and I am struggling with a way to ask it that properly holds how complex of a question this is. Um, and I'll just say it and then I'll sort of point out what I kind of understand about its complexities. And the question is, how dangerous is this? And when I say this, there's the complexity of like, okay, this is not something that is happening just because people you know ha you know got got grown up to be learned uh to hate you know there is there is things that are there is profit involved here social profit economic profit resource profit there's a lot of places that there are people with a lot of power that are profiting off the present dynamic that exists in between uh, Israel and Palestine and in the West Bank locally there, but also internationally, because those, those weapons are coming from somewhere. And I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, Canada is one of those places where Israel is buying weapons, right? So there's a lot to be profited from here. And you could say also there, are, there that, that the old hate profits from the, from the ongoing perpetuation of hatred, right? Um, but I don't mean that. I mean that in the sense of, how dangerous is it that this is happening? Because from what I understand, it's not uncommon for people to be killed for what they're doing being too big a threat to the way things are. So maybe you can comment a little bit on that with this question of how dangerous are these ayahuasca ceremonies and what's coming out of them? I think uh, how the question of how dangerous is uh, it depends who you're asking, whether living people who reside in the West Bank would have more danger than people who are residing within Israel. Uh, people within Israel residing in East Jerusalem might have more danger than other Palestinians who reside within Haifa, for example. Um, People from Gaza, if they get the chance, definitely their endangerment is higher. Now, 
again, this brings us again to the question, to the bottom point of what is this about? This is a study of what we have observed about people who have already been doing this for years, some, something new. And I think this is also a reminder to people who look at medicine and say it can make magic. Yes, it can make magic with intention and with act. It does not make magic alone. And we call it medicine for a reason. As you said, it's there is a system that profits that uh, profits from the status quo, whether financially or politically, from maintaining things as is, where animosity is what exists right now on the ground. And to shatter whatever, uh, let's say, uh, blind spots that we have inherited or built from experiencing life in a conflict zone, is an educational process that does not happen easily, specifically if you're trying to do it in the midst of the fire. We're not talking about a conflict that has been taking a pause for years and we're talking about preparation for reconciliation process. This is an ongoing uh, tragedy, if you ask me, that is happening on the ground here. And therefore, to continue approaching the study with humbleness and again and ask, what can we learn from as insights to bring outside and not to expect from medicine to do what we humans haven't been taking responsibility on doing. Mm. So again, to look at it humbly and say, what is it there that we need to learn? What is it there that we need to bring outside as of knowledge that is gained there to shatter all those blind spots that people come to due to everything you experience in a militarized conflict, to put it in perspective, and to really see how it can help. Again, from the beginning, this is not something that I expect every Palestinian Israeli to jump into, medicine space. This is not how you do peace alone. Uh, make, make, maybe we get the insights there of what we need for a healthier relation. And this is, I think, what the study sheds light at the relational element that is core to what is missing maybe in how we have been trying to do whether peacemaking or conflict resolution. And I think this is the core of the where we should keep the focus. Is it danger? Yes, it's danger. Just living in this land is danger mm -hmm. but on its own. Whether you're doing ayahuasca or walking in the street, you're in life threat of being killed one way or another. Mm -hmm. Whether you're a Palestinian or an Israeli, it's experienced differently. It's not to be compared. This is the reality of conflicts. It's mm -hmm. not something you watch from TV. It's something you live in. And uh, I, I don't want to say that there is or should be an exaggerated fear to say if uh, ayahuasca spaces continue, there's something to be extra worried from, because I also believe in the power of the medicine itself. It does teach people in their pace what they need to learn also. But what we're saying here, and I think what we're trying to look at here is what is the potential and should we Give that a try with an intention. Should people go there with an intention, actually? Should activists, for example, who experience burnout, and I was one of them, should they go together? Who people? And we're not talking about activists of just sitting in closed rooms and having dialogue spaces. We're talking about activists who hold hands together and go stand together in direct action. If we need fresh insight of how to remobilize communities towards moving forward, then, yeah, maybe we need to humbly come down to those spaces and learn. So I, I hope this gives an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say that, like, yeah, as Antoine said, uh, it is currently more dangerous to for Palestinians uh, from West Bank, uh, from Gaza, uh, to to engage, and also maybe Palestinians from Israel, uh, to engage in, in psychedelics, and to engage in joint actions, you know, uh, uh, being being you know seen as uh, normalizers and also the tension and that might come come from that. Uh, there was I don't know Antoine maybe you can uh, um, if you know more details, but there was like a, a guy from Gaza who was arrested for a Zoom call with Israelis uh, six months ago mm -hmm. uh, or a year ago. I'm not sure. And you know, so just the just the meeting Israelis sometimes is is dangerous for Palestinians for different reasons, 
uh, and also for Israelis, but to a less extent. So definitely those who are more risking are Palestinians who are joining uh, such spaces. And regarding the, the the dangerous, you know what you said, if it's challenging the status quo, it's it can create a reaction. Uh, so uh, and that reaction is dangerous. Uh, probably right now it's not dangerous because it's not really challenging the status quo. Uh, but hopefully it will be dangerous in the future, you know, because anything that will shift, would shift, would actually shift things is probably dangerous mm. uh, to engage with, you know, and uh, maybe it's just to how to do it uh, safely, how not to brag about things, how to do it, you know, in a humbleness that kind of doesn't attract uh, too much of those uh, reactions of, uh, you know, uh, kind of that can kind of uh, backlash. That hopefully this makes sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Antoine, did you want to comment on Lior's uh, mention of that uh, uh, person who was jailed for the Zoom call? I mean, this is uh, happened a year ago, uh, just mobilizing uh, sometimes a meetup. If it's not licensed in a way, could lead you to jail. This is what happened last year. It's a uh, general rule, goes again. Uh, the Palestinian community has a reaction also towards what is known as normalization, which is meetings that don't necessarily translate or transform realities, meetings that just gave for many years a fig leaf in a way for the relations that are not constructed on an intention of changing the status quo, basically. And again, they have, they have, we have justifiable, justifiable fear of those relations. So, uh, yes, it, it comes to down to this level if you do organize or meet, if it is not something within the what's accepted, or if you don't do it that way, it can get lead you to jail. So, let alone of going and experiencing something that is illegal, and in an underground community and a joint space. That can trigger a lot of uh, red flags, and specifically uh, that there has been a history within the Palestinian narrative uh, that we experience as a community that drugs have been one of the tools that the secret services always used against Palestinian youth and university because it's a shaming label to be known as somebody who used drugs. And so there, there is a lot of flags and there is a lot of insecurities that Palestinians would have to cross through prior to even just getting to a space of being with Israelis. And for those who do that, uh, again, to for me to respect that they've gone and been able to challenge themselves to go beyond that, whether for personal or for collective reasons, is something to honor and to try and support in that way. Mm -hmm. So, so this this might be a little a little bit of a sidestep, um, or I don't know if sidestep is the right word, but uh, a slight a slight shift in direction because Antoine, you're mentioned there about the the cultural stigma around drug use. Um, in Palestine. I assume there's a similar cultural stigma against drug use in Israel, although from what I understand, I met a lot of people from Israel who take a lot of acid and love Psytrance and it's like a thing. <laughs> so possibly the cultural stigmas are different. Um, but, but leaning from that, I, I'm really wondering, you know, like, how is it even that ayahuasca ceremonies exist um, in the Middle East? And from what I understand, they're not being led by Shipibo shamans singing Shipibo songs necessarily, that they're being led by people who are, if I understand, uh, Israeli people. And you're singing, the singing is of the traditional songs of, of each people. So, I mean, please correct me where I, I got that, that off, but you know, how, how did, how did ayahuasca come to be used in this context in, in, uh, in, in the West Bank and, and, and in the region? I mean, it's not something new uh, to the re to the region in general. Uh, maybe to uh, be spoken of is new. Maybe to that is starting to uh, re to appear above the surface through studies that are now allowed is bringing it up. Um, but I would say that even as we were doing this research, uh, 
many connections happened that even led me to connect with even regional uh, people who are doing it in other Middle Eastern countries, Arab, 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 Arab countries. So it's not shocking that it uh, it reached. Uh, the dynamics of the, and, and the or you can comment on this more, the dynamics of the holdings and who is holding, it has been different in different spaces, different times. The or you can share more also on that. Yeah, so I guess the, for the question of how it reached, I can answer on, on Israel. Uh, I'm not sure how it reached Palestine or other Arab countries. Uh, but I mean, first of all, as you said, this Israel is a kind of, there's, like a, there is a lot of psychedelics in Israel. Uh, side trance is huge. There's a huge history of like acid and Goa trance and, you know, people travel to Goa. So uh, Israelis, after they finish the army, even in the army already, they take acid in their weekends and then go back to the army, right? So, uh, the, and, but it's definitely this kind of traveling. The Israeli who travels after the army goes to Goa and, you know, does whatever is in the scene over there, then brings it back home, goes to, uh, Peru or Brazil and then kind of brings it back home. So I think this kind of travel that many Israelis, uh, do and being part of that is what brings it eventually back home. And I assume in Europe, and that the U.S. might similar dynamics uh, might happen, and in our Arab countries in the Middle East probably. Uh, but Israel has a kind of a rich, I think, psychedelic culture within it. Uh, there is a lot of like uh, the Israeli ethos is very much like balagan, like we like the mess, we like the the kind of going out of our minds, uh, we like journeying and traveling, and you know whether it's abroad or uh, or or <laughs> inter internally. Uh, so I think it's part of that. So Ayahuasca reached, I think, 20 years ago to Israel. And you, I think in the beginning, uh, Santo Daimi, uh, and then other kind of uh, Amazonian practices. And the music has changed through the years. And it's not just Jewish music or uh, Arab music. Uh, it is a lot of time traditional music, Santo Daimi music, uh, Amazonian music. And then it's kind of in, starts to incorporate other elements uh, as well, and now Arab music when Palestinians are also joining the ceremonies. So it's kind of uh, being changed uh, in time and also the ceremony structure and how uh, how much it kind of absorbs from the local culture uh, is also changed through time. And uh, facilitators, I guess there were there are Palestinian facilitators as well that started. There are more of them uh, right now. So maybe 20 years ago, it was mainly Israelis facilitators or people from the Amazon or or Europe. And now in the last few years, there are more Palestinian facilitators. Uh, so yeah, that that's changing as well. So go going going further on questions about the actual sort of like the ayahuasca circles and less about the sort of psychological political context um is is there any uh ha, ha, did you encounter any alterations of the brews that were using um historically culturally or sort of locally significant plants for example um there's a whole movement in australia to be using australian acacias instead of uh, Socotria veritas, instead of Chacruna, or even using Syrian rue, which is a comes from a, a tree in in, uh, in, uh, in in the Middle East, along with acacias. And there are psychoactive acacias in the Middle East as well. So did you encounter any, I mean, blatantly different psychoactives, but any incorporations of different sort of uh, culturally, historically significant plants, local plants in any of the brews in, the, in those circles? Um, many, many speak about Syrian rue and about using it, and it's like because it's local, local plant. Uh, so, but uh, people, from what I heard, they prefer the, they prefer the vine, they prefer the ayahuasca, and uh, but th definitely people are testing and trying. And I can say, I say that in the last year, as the kind of uh, global market of our ayahuasca had uh, challenges of travel. Uh, from the Amazon to the Middle East, then people, it's kind of because of because of COVID, uh, then there's more tension of cre actually creating, using the local plants. So I heard many who use uh, Syrian rue actually together with mushrooms mm -hmm. and kind of create the kind of, uh, in a way, something which is similar to ayahuasca in to some extent, or has the kind of the ayahuasca spirit in the mushrooms as well. Uh, so... 
I think the last year has brought more innovation uh, because of that. But generally, people want to use local plants, but in the end, they kind of they use they use ayahuasca. Yeah. Antoine, anything to add there? No. Um, okay. Uh, is I mean, I don't know if this is sensitive enough not not to speak about it at all. I could imagine that there are some things that were learned that in order to protect those spaces doesn't make sense to share. Um, so that said, um, is there are are there um, sort of introduced crops like are for example in Hawaii? You can drink cappy vine that has existed in Hawaii for 20 years. It doesn't get imported from uh, from South America. Is there any local cultivation, which, well, sort of local, I don't know if it would count as a cultivar of, of either of the ayahuasca plants, or is everything still imported um, from South America? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um... I think maybe some people like grow like the chacruna or jurema, but um, like I'm not sure actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, and Antoine, I got a I got a head shaking from you. So. Yeah, I, and again, I think what Leo also shared before the lockdown of Corona made people start thinking and looking for the local, where again, the reality we exist in. This is illegal. This is shamed yet. So even to look into your own history, indigenous, what you have, just finding simple stuff and like asking people around it. I've got questions and answers from people who are like, they're amazed that this actually a, a potential of existing here. And also the last, I would say the conversations that were happening globally on how to be responsible and sensitive to culture and plants globally have raised this wish among people to look deep inside and early instead of just relying on what exists. So I'm hearing more about those conversations now. We're seeing people more asking questions, looking for alternative, uh, but uh, whether it's planting or really coming to something local 100%, I haven't heard of people being able to create that, that space so far. Great. I can tell you that. Go ahead. Sorry, I can just tell you I'm working with a Palestinian student who that's her passion right now to kind of uh, investigate Syrian rule and uh, way it's used indigenously or, or, or in the contemporarily. Uh, but there's also like an under a political undertone to this, which is quite cool, you know, because w the conflict is about like who's indigenous in, mm. in a way, right? So you start working with the indigenous plant and they in a way connect you more to the land. And the land is a very loaded political thing. It's not just like Pachamama, it's the holy land that we fight on, you know, and the plants kind of connect you more to that land. And there's like, there's a political undertone which can be. Uh, healing, but it can also be subverted into like kind of like uh, uh, opposite, you know, opposition. You know, this is like the indigenous plants. They were used in the Bible, and therefore they kind like they they related more to that identity, and they can you know enhance different identities and things like this. So this is like I think investigating just that the uh, kind of political meanings of using using indigenous plants can can be quite a fascinating uh, research topic by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, makes me think of uh, Wahid. I don't remember his last name uh, from a group called the Fatima Sufi Order, yeah. who presented yeah, yeah. Uh, that uh, Heoma was a Syrian rue and acacia blend, um, and had some sort of sanction from a, a religious leader that it was uh, it was halal to drink. Yeah, in, the, in Iran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so interesting. Um, Let's get into uh, let's get into actually the types of experiences that people were having. Um, you classified a number of different sort of kinds of experiences, um, and then gave examples, um, case reports, trip reports of people, and saying like this type of experience exampled in this story, for example. So um, if it works for you guys, I will uh, just say each. Uh, each of the types of experiences, and then I'd love to hear your comments on what it is and whatever other comments you want to add uh, to it. So, all good? 
Okay, so I'll go through them one by one. Uh, and some of this might be sort of repeating, but I think it will be value valuable for the listeners because there's a lot to hold in, in this in this conversation. Um, so the first one is unity based connection. Yeah, Swan, do you want me to go? You, you. Uh, so I guess that's like the I guess the obvious one, right? The oneness, the mystical union, the communitas, the identity, the solution. So the the experience is usually told in a way of like uh identities uh, did not matter in that space uh, there was only love and unity and human to human connection uh, and all this kind of uh, israeli palestinian thing is uh, dropped and appealed in the moment and as i said these are important moments for the creation of the group uh for the kind of tribal feeling of the group for for it's it's a uh, regardless of the israelis and palestinians this is a strong incentive to return to a group practice is to feel this kind of uh, group unity together with other people. Uh, so it was like a very important experience for those who described it. Uh, we didn't with this because for for uh, sorry. So because it was kind of, of in a way obvious, obvious. It's like, to some extent we didn't expand too much on it in the paper, but it's definitely an important and, and crucial experience to the Western practice of psychedelics, you know, so perennial philosophy and mystical union, they're all kind of in that uh, uh, group uh, oneness in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and Antoine, before you comment there, uh, I assume that part of not focusing too deeply on it is wrapped up with a criticism that you offered to this Western paradigm um, in the paper, which is sort of too much focus on like, you know, uh, inner spirituality, the individual, the sort of like, I don't think you use this terminology, but like the a cultural mystical type experiences, as if really such a thing could exist. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I, I assume that's those the, the critical lens that you held on the over focus of that in the Western paradigm is one of the reasons Western paradigms research of psychedelics now is one of the reasons why you didn't dive too deeply into it. Is that uh, accurate? Yeah, for sure. Um, and again, it's like it's not exactly just individual or inner process because it's a group unity that we're speaking it on. Uh, so it's not just like as the therapy, but definitely one of the reasons we didn't go deep into it is also certain criticism of over. It's not that the experience is beautiful and amazing and many, many, you know, uh, 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 for me as well on a personal journey, I love those moments, you know, but and too much uh, kind of attaching to these moments is, uh, I guess, that's the critical point here. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is, yeah, this, this is what it comes down to from, from my shoes, where I stand in this uh, kind of work is, what, what this means to me is really people coming to an ability to see uh, beyond the animosity, beyond the fear, beyond everything that in a way uh, shatters your possibility of partnership, of being able to uh, see beyond. And so those moments uh, that were mentioned, that were observed in the, the documentation as we did the interviews, are, are not... Uh, something that uh, just describes unity it describes something that we really uh, fail to see in this land in those spaces in this depth uh, and it's not something just to look at it again and say yeah this is what we need because this is obviously not the solution alone in itself and uh, we see the criticism towards it also ourselves and it's really to look at it and to say um, understanding that this is important in our cultures and where we are and the communities we are we come and we live in, it's not really that much only individualistic. And so it's not only about you, it's about you and your people that you're living with. And so Israeli and Palestinian are going through this experience and being able to 
go that far and see the human after pain, after suffering, after purging together, seeing that the other has the same feelings, pain. It's not something to take lightly again, but it's something to look deeper in. And uh, yeah, it's it's a moment that's uh, a way in in a way it's a, a wish for everyone who is working conflict resolution. Hmm. Okay, so uh, the next the next uh, category of experiences you have is recognition and difference based connection. Should we go again, Antoine? Have preference? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I guess this is kind of like the the mirror to the, to the previous one. So it is usually a moment of uh, because the ceremonies were observed there. There is a participatory elements in them, so uh, uh, people can bring their own prayers or music or uh, songs into the space, and uh, not immediately. Usually, like after a third of the ceremony or half of the ceremony, like the floor is open in a way for others to share. Uh, so that allows the expression of different kind of backgrounds, cultures, energies, emotions and stuff. Uh, so most of the story is actually from Israeli side that we heard uh, listening to Arabic music. And some of them were uh, Arabic listening to, to Hebrew music, but most of them were of Israelis listening to Arabic music. And again, the Palestinians in these groups uh, were a minority. So there, it's kind of like uh, maybe even challenged for a moment, this kind of just uh, we're all humans. And it is listening to the music in, of the other uh, can a lot of times bring fear in the beginning. And this is something many described. It brings this resistance and fear because it's closer to challenging your narrative. It's closer for you in the connection to actually the other and not just the human and the other, but the act, you know, something which is other culturally and nationally, uh, uh, other than you. So it's, it, there's a potential of challenging the narrative. So I think the resistance is also more kind of coming for, uh, defense of that. Uh, but then in the moment which people actually manage to, you know, let go into this and listen to this, uh, it's usually very beautiful moments. People actually talk about that as like the something was missing from the ceremony and then suddenly something was there mm. as if the elephant of the in the room was not actually there as long as the music is just in like uh, uh, Amazonian Icaros or uh, Jewish uh, prayers uh, it's the something is not included in the ceremony and suddenly there's a strong uh, relief or a strong excitement in the group so people talk about uh, expansion as if the group kind of opens up from individual process to a group process and when this happens an expansion is kind of the local jargon for uh, being aware to the to the group so something expands uh, people talk about like this awe in this moment and silence uh, like uh, sacred silence that comes after such moments and uh, what I think that awe is quite like an interesting uh, emotion to have in these moments because awe is an emotion that's usually comes, it comes from, it needs two things. One is uh, vastness, like the size of thing, it's big. And the other is challenging your uh, uh, mental structures. You know, it's new. Uh, it's you'd never connected it to something in that in that way before. So awe can come, you know, when you have a psychedelic experience from the first time, when you climb a mountain and you see a, see a view uh, of something for the first time, when you have a strong insight on things. It's something that comes when you're when something is challenged as well, the way you regularly perceive the world. So these are moments of awe because they they something is changed in people. They manage to people talk about the language so. Uh, listening, in, engaging and with Arabic language and starting to actually love and connect to, to that language. Uh, so definitely something is changing in this moment for people. Uh, and, and for Palestinians, it's like an important moment of, of, mostly of recognition. So recognition is an act that both sides are kind of, it's kind of this dance, you know, you need both the expression of something and the, and the side that suddenly kind of is recognizing. So, I kind of see recognition is like this, uh, you know, it's a very political term, but it's also something, it's a consciousness, uh, a moment of altered consciousness, because uh, it's a moment of uh, something new from your regular uh, social structures, which usually don't recognize 
that part of that you know person or people yeah yeah those differences uh, I, I believe this is uh, again uh, part of the process that is deeply held and deeply admired in it that people come to see difference and not just run away from it or try to hide it uh, they see the difference in the culture they see the difference in, in everything that who represent in, in who they represent and their being in their presence in the space and 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 this is this is powerful it can create this shift this this expansion among individuals to and how I observed it to be able to uh, enlarge in their ability to embrace truths or being or identity or narrative or whatever they are struggling with to embrace or to not necessarily even embrace just to expand for uh, it's new new is painful sometimes and uh, yeah you can meet the Israeli and the Palestinian and have the first encounter, but as Leo described, it's like when you're hearing songs of the other, things that trigger pain in you, because you know those songs as the songs of the other and his, to, to celebrate with the other and their joy in that sense, to sing the songs can trigger a lot of pain. It's how can I celebrate the other? And and that's like, I believe where people go into that deeper process and deeper process that is again, has a lot to be learned from and to be understood because it's not easy to be done in spaces of conflict. We see Palestinians and Israelis getting high on each other, but they're easily in, in, in cognitive spaces where they meet in, in closed rooms. But in milliseconds, if you just name a cultural figure that is witnessed from another side as a threat to the other side, that celebration of culture, that celebration of uh, the otherness just collapses. And so here to really look and see how this can be transformed and can be dealt with through seeing what people go through in those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I really love what you're saying there. And I, I see how that overlaps with uh, or connects with earlier when you were talking about um, how creating an apolitical space can sort of dismantle the ability to carry what is learned out of those experiences into actual change um, politically into into activism because um, I, I believe in the paper I got a note here uh, that you said that um, uh, it can marginalize discussions on the need for political liberation um, so having that sort of recognition and base, difference based connection I see how it can really play into the uh, I think Antoine earlier you were making the comment about um I think you would use the term growing flowers or something like this. Um so moving on to the next result, uh power imbalances. That's how it's called. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wrote it in power imbalances. <laughs> but it's good. Like uh no, I, I think also I think that the next theme is called like the conflict related revelations, but actually power imbalances is the what to speak about because uh, you know, even that uh, connection that uh, I describe passionately about like the connecting to the other, uh, you know, it's like what is exactly the other can be also a can still be apolitical, you know, if the other is defined as like uh, the Arab culture, listening to Arab culture as like this kind of exotic thing. Uh, and not, it's not related necessarily to political, uh, the political national identity of Palestinians, which is looking for liberation, uh, but it's more this kind of like uh, pan Arabic, uh, you know, uh, beauty, which is a bit exotic. And so even like that, that can, listening to music of the other can be in a way uh, a depoliticized uh, or a political moment. Uh, so. Uh, and that's also how it's integrated, you know, and what's the meaning that's kind of loaded on it and how sometimes the me political meanings can be uh, kind of uh, hidden. And actually the the way you give meaning to this after can actually hide uh, political meanings of recognition and expansion actually after that. Uh, so the third theme was actually uh, con like conflict-related uh, revelations, and many times they were about power imbalance because the conflict is imbalanced. Uh, so, you know, this can be 
uh, Israeli who sees uh, himself in the army, army doing a house arrest and that sees it from the sides of the side of the family and experience the whole pain of the family that their child is taken from in this kind of very casual house arrest. Uh, so, uh, and then he feels the guilt of that, you know, so the, the guilt in the moment, and that's kind of actually motivates him to change the ceremony, to sing a song in the ceremony, and to kind of bring that insight from the serum, from the vision into the ceremony. And other visions are related to the Nakba, uh, or, or the pain of the, the other side. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times because they are political, the the injustice is uh, kind of in them to some extent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm noticing now my notation was off because conflict related re- revelations is further down, and imba- power imbalances might have been a note that I took on something else in the wrong place. It's an important note, <laughs> very important, important note. Yeah, um, and and what you were saying there about the uh, soldier who saw himself from the eyes of the family um, whom he adopted from—that's part of uh, I think the section on seeing the other side, which. Um, I think it's fair to say that I, it's uncommon to cry while reading a research paper. Um, I think so anyways, it is for me. And I definitely was really, really moved by hearing that, that particular story or reading that particular story. Um, so I'll step back here, Antoine, if you'd like to add anything on conflict related revelations. Not much to add. Again, it's all out there in the study and people can easily re- re- get to it and read what we have came up, came up with. But what I would say about, around it that it's it's it shouldn't be surprising because people just experience conflicts there in the magnitude intensified uh, more than what it exists in the reality. It's like the 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 they they get in in in, in what what I what I remember like they get the lore of it in, in, in this time. And so to really understand that this is not just a, a matter of a conflict that a person has experienced for a year in his life and that reading and understanding uh, those those testimonies that the revelations are not related to an individual only. It's related to communities who are locked in this conflict for 70 years. And so this is really not just the story of a group or an individual, it's a story of people who have been uh, in this cycle of violence for the last 70 years. That it continues to shift, whether from location or intensity. But this is continuous, and this is actually what we documented in a way is how it manifests also 70 years down the road, even if it's not happening personally in your own lifetime. Mm. Yeah. So I, I, wanna, I go ahead. I just want to add on the story of the soldier that like, uh, uh, I many few years ago, not many, like I think four years ago, maybe in, in a conference in Israel, I said that I want to do uh, peace work with Israelis, Palestinians and psychedelics. And, and people heard it, and then they told that guy to, like, that guy connected to me. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and he told me his story before we the f- official interview actually happened. You know, I, I was crying, and I actually felt something very different. And it was a pivotal moment in deciding, actually, to first investigate, do observational research, investigating in the underground, listening to the story of people uh, in the underground. And that journey, uh, I mean, and that 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 guy... Uh, very meaningful. Uh, his story is very meaningful for me, and also like just the journey, also with Antoine of like doing a road trip of a month and listening to stories. The the level of tears that I, I cried in those stories was uh, quite a lot. I I glad that managed to transfer a bit into a scientific paper, but yeah, there was like deep stuff uh, going in these interviews, uh, and. Yeah, I guess this is what just what I wanted to say, and thankful for the, uh, thankful also for the interviewees that kind of uh, shared st- stuff like this with us. Mm-hmm. So, in having you know, sort of riffing off Antoine, you're like, well, you could you, you could read the paper; it's all in there. And also, you know, as I look over the list of the results, it's it's we've already talked about a number of these things in in throughout the discussion. Uh, for example, you know, the connection through music and prayer. We talked about that in the recognition and uh, difference-based connection. Um, experiencing awe 
Um, although you experience awe and silence. So if either of you want to comment on that in a second, please do and what they mean by that. We talked about conflict related revelations and, and Antoine, your comment of like, this isn't an individual thing. This is a, a thing that's happening in people over the course of 70 years, um, you know, would touch to the collective and intergenerational revelations, seeing the other side we've talked about. And of course, seeing the pain in the land, because at some point earlier in the discussion, there was the mention of the story of, of the vision of, of the blood soaking into the land through the repeated cycles of conflict. Um, so before we move on, perhaps to what might be the last question, there there's two ones that that I, I'd like you to maybe comment on, which is um, in the experiencing awe part of why you have and silence there. And then also there was a there was a collection of, of results that you saw as a connection through paraverbal qualities of each language, which personally I don't really understand. Um, so I would appreciate being explained to so that I can know, um, but also in a sense of how that came up in the experience as well. So those are the, it's sort of like a double question that you can tackle however you two like. So we'll start with the moment of the uh, the hour and the silence, and I would say that this is something uh, that might be surprising for people, that people in conflict can come to a place of silence for a minute and being actually with the depth of the pain or the depth of the change that they're experiencing, and 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 that's something that is not also far from uh, in a way like showing us what is the situation on a social level because if you look also at what is what has happened in the last cycle the last round that had just took over in the land we found ourselves as people who are in joint spaces or activists being silent being in awe because we we didn't know what to say and i would say to a great extent this could be representing what what people are experiencing. And it's, it's not something easy to, again, live in a conflict zone, let alone live and trip in a conflict zone and try and integrate that in it as you're living in it. Uh, that's, I can imagine this is where our, the majority of the silence in those moments come from. Uh, yeah, the... Yeah, you mentioned that there's a lot of things that came up in the research that so connection more. Uh, the paraverbal, you want to add on that one, Dior? What exactly you noticed on this? Yeah, so maybe I'll start with the paraverbal. Yeah, it's like a kind of it's a reviewer's comment actually that changed the title of the <laughs> that theme. And originally, I used the language of the of the participants, which was like uh, hearing the frequency or the vibration of the other language. Uh, and that's what they said, you know, uh, paraverbal qualities of the other language is kind of like a theorizing upon it, about that idea. But they speak, people speak about the vibration and the frequency of other language. It creates different visions. It has a different emotions that come with that. Uh, so these qualities are not related to the content of the song, but actually to the a tone of the song. Uh, sometimes people see, say that they can see this vibration in the air even, you know, uh, it's kind of, uh, tr it's being uh, vibrated uh, between like the, pe the people in the rituals, uh, which is also related to some, um, you know, Amazonian notions in which the music is like this uh, sonic substance that is a relational process that kind of penetrates from one person to to the other. Uh, it's substance moving in the air to the other. Uh, so that's the kind of the paraverbal stuff. Um, again, with awe and silence, I said before that awe is like moments in which uh, there's vastness and change of of your structure. You know, so there's like uh, moments of insights uh, and moments of newness. A lot of times they create awe. Uh, and the silence is the people talk about this kind of sacred it's a sacred silence that comes after these like there's a something special happened you know there's no need to move to the next song immediately uh, let's stay with that as a group um people might recognize i know i know from you know not the israeli palestinian context but uh, sometimes moments in in rituals and ceremonies maybe some people that listen to it had that uh, in which uh, there is a lot of judgment towards some somebody 
uh, and you're like the judgment is really annoying. It's holding you. It's holding you in your process, and maybe it's holding the whole group in the process, maybe. And then that person suddenly sings or do something that really shifts the, your awareness to that person. So there's a moment of uh, recognition. You suddenly see something in that person uh, which is different, and that creates a certain energy in the space, which I think. Uh, uh, is similar from at least my personal processes is something similar to what people described is suddenly this like awe and silence and recognition of something else. Um, yeah, there was one thing, uh, although I would like to add, uh, if it's okay, uh, about uh, delivery, because I didn't mention that too, we didn't talk about it too much, you know. So, in the uh, there is a kind of sub theme in the conflict related revelations, which is the d- delivery. Uh, of of them and there's a whole paper about that process uh, that uh, just submitted and i find it quite interesting as a moment of like uh, a traumatic revelation also creates uh, in many of the people this it creates a need to share the truth of the revelation or deliver the message of the revelation sometimes it's a political message it's about injustice and it's kind of in a way reminds of like a prophetic process it's not just the message but it's also the the uh, transferring the message to this other the, to the others so for example the, the the vision of the soldier in the army it was triggered by palestinian group who was crying in the ceremony uh, so five palestinians they, as a group they started to have this collective cry together and that triggered the vision of the army for that israeli guy and after that vision he was very strong with guilt in the moment he kind of deli- delivered uh, through a song he tried to deliver this kind of uh, truth uh, which has also a politic a political uh, in a way uh, emancipatory uh, message in it so a kind of see it as an important process it's something that's also transferred to the rest of the group oh. Hmm. Oh, i look forward to reading that paper when it's out uh, antoine did you want to comment on that uh that stuff about delivery before we move on to the last question no okay um all right so there might be one more question but uh, i think this is the last one and uh, i think it's it's probably fair to say that journalism in the era of social media internet is lacking uh, the type of robust um, integrity it once had slash does have in other places slash could still have. Um, And in reading your paper, one of the things that I thought about was the potential headlines, assuming that people are able to grok the intensity of this, like the, the possibilities of this paper enough so to write on it. Um, but, uh, headlines, something like ayahuasca, ayahuasca can, might solve the Israel, Israel, Palestine conflict, or like, uh, psychedelics pose, uh, the potential of resolving conflict in the West, West bank, something like this. Um, so it's something like, you know, what say you to those potential headlines? Yeah, they exist. Hopefully, not too much. And uh, uh, what what we say, uh, we try to find the journalists who would tro- who would write about it. You know, in a way that doesn't have such headlines. Uh, I can tell you that may, many uh, media outlets didn't want the story so much because of the nuances mm-hmm. and the complexity and the no no clear headline actually, uh, except of you know Israelis and Palestinians are doing ayahuasca together. Uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't, this paper doesn't have a very clear narrative. It's, there's, it has a lot of like also critiques and nuances. And, uh, and also because of the timing of the paper, we withdrew, we did withdraw some of the like press release, uh, that was supposed to come with the paper, uh, cause it came out just when the last rupture uh, of conflict, uh, the violent uh, conflict happened. Uh, so. Yeah, I guess that. But the uh, headline, what we, I don't know. It's like we, we, we hope that they won't be too much, because uh, they also actually bring the criticism in a way. You know, those headlines also create criticism of this, of this stuff, and kind of people start to perceive our intentions behind it in, in such way, and that's mm-hmm. kind of uh, damaging, I guess. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the journalist, even if it's a good guy, sometimes the editor is the one who decides on the headline, you know, so right. it's a, it's a hard one. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah. Antoine, before you begin, might I say that I, I it was really satisfying to watch you start sort of like laughing behind your mute when I brought up that question. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to hearing your comments. No, I mean, uh, this is uh, this is again why I was saying we really need to manage our expectations as humans and take responsibility also. Uh, conflicts are not going to be resolved by a tea or a pill. It's going to take individuals who create conflicts and energy and an effort to stop conflicts. Yet I would resolve to... Uh, why are we tapping to this? It's the consciousness into how we can resolve conflicts. It's not going to give us the master plan. It might teach us to do things in a more sensitive way where we might be able to draw a vision of a better day tomorrow out of this that responds to 80% of the people because unfortunately there isn't a vision that applies to 100 people of 100% uh, of every side. But at least to have a vision that's informed by those deep values that are experienced in those spaces. And this is what it, in, in my vision, in my understanding, and in my uh, way of even looking at it, this is the minimal, humble way to approach it. We shouldn't be waiting for ayahuasca to solve the conflict. That is ridiculous. If it is here to humble us as people, to relearn how to talk to our communities, how to mobilize them, how to bring out change differently, then we are deeply thankful for that. We shouldn't expect more than that. Mm, beautiful. Uh, also, Leo, I, I was not surprised um, to hear a thing that I hadn't anticipated was that media outlets were sort of hands off. Um, yeah, I outside of the West Bank and the that specific place of conflict, um, it remains very contentious to give an opinion on who's who and who is the bad guy and whatever else as labels uh, get thrown around and a lot of hate gets expressed as well. So it's kind of, it can be hard to tease out and uh, it's easy for people understandably to want to not have a strong opinion so as to not be caught with some overreactive label or accidentally come off associating with people whose values are more sort of uh, aligned with hatred and judgment of the other than otherwise. Um, so I, did either of you want to comment on that before we close? No, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, it was surprised for me as well, surprising for me as well. Hmm. Let's say. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Thank you, both of you, so much for this interview and the work that you've been doing and that uh, and for bringing forth that work uh, to the world to witness. And Antoine, uh, a lot of what you are saying, you know, hopefully be humbled and inspired by the possibilities of how we, I say we, although I'm not really there with you, you know, um, can think differently and act differently about all of this. Uh, is there a uh, is there anywhere other than directly going to that paper to read it, which I will link to in the show notes, um, or to your bios, uh, which I will also link to the show notes, your research gate pages and stuff? Any particular places that you would encourage people to go to if they'd like to follow up on what they've heard here and or express their support uh, in some way? Good question. Doesn't I think exist yet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Juan, you're, you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah. We're the first two people who dare to put their heads out. <laughs> so let's wait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your 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 laughter and joy is very infectious. Um, okay. Well, then on that note, um, I'll be sure that I'll get relevant links from you guys, uh, whatever they are, and include them in the show notes at jameswgesso.com. And again, thank you both uh, for your time and for your work. Thank you. Thanks for the thank interview. You. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It was fun. Thank and, you. And cut. 
Okay, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. If you liked it, please share it with a friend, share it out and about on the internet in whichever way you feel inclined to. And if you appreciate the efforts that go behind producing this show, you can contribute financially uh, by Patreon, PayPal, or cryptocurrency, all of which are linked in the description to this episode. Now, at the beginning, I had mentioned that there was a sort of a personal sort of insight into my life and, uh, you know, request. Um, so I'm going to lay it out now here, which is that, um, my grandfather has recently become significantly ill, uh, and he has made the request for the family to come to see him for one last time. Um, ideally not one last time, but likely one last time altogether. And so I am going to be joining my family to do that. Um, and it's going to be quite an expensive trip for me. Um, and if you were ever interested in donating to the podcast, it would be really great if you happen to do that in the next uh, few weeks time, which would be a great opportunity to help me um, have the the added resources in order to follow through with this. It comes with no expectation, no guilt, or anything like that. Um, if that was already something you were looking to do, um, now would be a great time. But don't worry about it too much. <laughs> it's not yours to worry about, I guess. Uh, it is mine and my family's. But um, so that's that's the that's the update and the request. Um, nonetheless, thank you for your caring that you care to listen to this section uh, of the interview where I sort of revealed a little bit about my personal situation right now. And um, yeah, I hope you're well. I hope your family is well. And um, I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care. <laughs>